So we really did have a spectacular session this morning where we heard about science that should be able to translate to the clinic. Um, and we've got our Alpha Clinic directors here. Um, we've got uh, Mark Walters and uh, Daniela Bota. We've got John Adams, Mirta Betty, uh, John Zaya, unfortunately couldn't make it today, but he sends his um, welcome to everyone. Uh, he's one of our friends in the Alpha Clinic network. And we have Eugene Brandon, who runs the Translating Center. Thank you, Eugene, for being here. Uh, we've certainly worked very closely with Eugene over the last few years. Uh, so Ben, uh, Dr. Heyman is an assistant prof professor in the Division of Regenerative Medicine. He's also the director of our Komen Outpatient Pavilion Stem Cell Clinic that has become quite a bit busier these days. So he's doing a fantastic job with that. We thought Ben could grill us for the next uh, little while. So thank you, Dr. Heyman, for being here. Oh, it's really my pleasure, privilege to be with you all today. Um, and so thank you for taking the time. Uh, and uh, let me, I guess Dr. James was kind of ready to introduce our panel and for really kind of uh, everyone here who's joining us for this kind of um, kind of this discussion really about the kind of stem cell clinical trials, kind of the direction of the alpha stem cell clinics. Um, and so I'll certainly try to, uh, to ask some questions, but really leave it up to our distinguished uh, me panel members to lead the discussion here today. And so maybe I'll, maybe I'll start with the first question to the, all, the, all, the, all the panelists. Uh, you know, with, with the recent, um, with CERN being refunded and then the kind of the hope to expand the alpha stem cell clinics, kind of where do you see the, the direction of the alpha stem cell clinics and the potential with the new um, awardees? Kind of how do you see things going forward? And kind of, I'll open it up to anybody who wants to feel free to, to start us. So, um, you know, with the passage of the new um, uh, CERM funding, they're going to request that the alpha stem cell clinics actually go out uh, into parts of the state and parts of the inner city environments um, in California to try and make people aware of what the alpha stem cell clinics do. So I'm assuming that the we will sort of become hubs um, for spokes that go out to various uh, parts of California, both in Northern California, Central and Southern California to try and bring um, knowledge, education, and even recruitment of individuals into stem cell therapeutic trials that are ongoing either as an inpatient in the various center hubs, which would be um, the academic medical centers, or actually in outpatient um, clinical trials that are, are taking place uh, primarily at the site where the patient is residing. And that could be um, a patient actually hooking up with their primary care physician uh, in Riverside or someplace like that. And that being the spoke that connects to the hub for the trial that the patient is actually being involved with. Well, thank you very much. Um, that certainly sounds very exciting and kind of the direction of you see it. Does anybody have any additional thoughts from any of the panelists about kind of what else they yeah, think things are happening? I think for the first iteration of CIRM, uh, Ben, we were really focused primarily on cellular therapies and really getting those to the patients. But I think what we can look at is a combination strategy now where we have small molecules, as John and I were talking about just before we started this call, spicy modulators, for example, uh, biologics, and uh, bring those together with cellular therapeutics to see if we can enhance, for example, axonal guidance if we transplant neural stem cells. So those are just um, opportunities that I think that we should be looking at through our Alpha Clinic network. So I think the key is really expanding the network with Eugene Brandon's help and other people at CIRM so that we can do this even more efficiently. Uh, we've got master um, organizers like Daniela Boda here and people who come up with big ideas like Mark Walter and, and uh, Mayor Dad, who actually makes the therapies. So I think that um, there's an opportunity to really enhance the strength of the network and really make sure that patients get access to the highest level of care closer to home uh, to really reiterate what you've said, John. Uh, I think that's the most important thing personally. I'm going to add, uh, my answer will be uh, more of the same, which sounds like a really boring answer. But, uh, but in fact, I think we underestimate what we have done uh, 
in the first round of uh, Apple Stem Cell Clinics there. You know, it's a huge, huge, you know, task that was done. There were so many uh, different groups that we are putting together, you know, from uh, and then clinical trials, all the steps from initiation to IND to uh, contract and everything else. We have done a tremendous job setting up that uh uh that uh you know uh background there and now i, I think we are ready to move forward uh, so it's a more of a same it is it, it's the same direction we have gone but more of that in a much bigger scale because you know every single day uh now we're getting approached by companies by different departments divisions now we have the recognition. They know there is an Apple Systems Clinic. It wasn't like that a few years ago when we started, but now we have we have the name, we have the recognitions, and now we can you know again do a much much better job to expand these in a much bigger scale uh, through all the diff different divisions and departments there. So it is a boring answer, but I think it's a, it's a very important answer. <laughs> I would like to add maybe the fact that now we're going to have the opportunity to be much more involved on medical economics because we are dedicated not only to bringing new therapies to the patients in California, but also to bring therapies that can be used that have the ability to be well priced and well distributed. I'm personally very excited about the new directions and a new guidance from CERM that we will be able to have our own CGMP facilities working together to be able to reach the price point that will make sense for the medical system in California and above. And, and I don't have very much to add. This is Mark Walters from, from UCSF, except that, um, I, I mean, we've already seen this revolution that has occurred in cancer therapy by harnessing uh, immunotherapies for, for um, targeted cancers. And, and we've lagged behind in hereditary disorders that, that we might cure by, by cell and gene therapies. But what we have now are, are new, exciting new reagents in the CRISPR technology to, to edit the genes that we know are defective in some of these um, disorders in, in the stem cells where the origin of the disease resides. So I, I, th I view the next year as being very exciting as we, as we expand our application of, of these new gene, gene editing tools into, into novel curative therapies. So this is John Adams again at UCLA, and I wanted to ask Daniel Bota um, a question. So one of the targets uh, for CIRM is to increase um, the availability of uh, payment for some of these expensive therapeutics, right, to patients who really can't afford it. And that's always been a sticking point at um, you know, the academic medical center. Uh, because there just isn't enough money to pay for uh, somebody who's getting, um, you know, metaportic stem cell therapeutic therapeutics uh, that involve uh, gene therapy. And I was wondering if Daniela had any thoughts about how we, or CERM has any ideas about how we can pay for these things. So John, that's an exceptional question, and it's a question that was raised uh, multiple times in the last years, including the story of uh, genetic syndromes that we do have now treatments for, but the treatments are too expensive to be able to be offered on large amounts. And I would go back to what I said. If uh, we will continue to have our own production ability if our network is going to be able to carry those treatments through approval, through the BLA process, then the price of those treatments will be much more accessible for the network. I also know that CERM funds a number of those studies in collaboration with industry. And it is our sincere hope that part of those discussions of the funding discussions do include also discussions about the price point and how will that integrate with the current existing therapies. But I'm very curious to hear from my other colleagues as well as from CERM, what is at the forefront of those economic discussions? I can add, uh, because in the last probably six months, uh, we have spent a tremendous amount of time 
uh, to 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 talk about these things and, and work on this. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I think uh, you know uh, uh, Dr. Jameson knows about this as well. Uh, that we have started working with some of the nonprofit organizations, trying to uh, uh, you know come with the solutions that basically we're using homegrown car products uh, uh, like CAR T cells or, or or gene therapy like for sickle cells, and uh, and try to use those uh, in in individual organizations. We don't you know in in a kind of like a point of care, uh, you know, applications with some, some sort of a central monitoring. Um, so we will not rely completely on, on pharma uh, to provide these. They just say sickle cell, for example, I think they're, you know, they're talking about $2 million. Uh, you know, that was, uh, that was at least one application went to European uh, Union for the, uh, for the uh, cure of sickle cell with the gene therapy. And just, you know, that's, uh, you know, maybe some of the more developed countries can pay for that, but how can you do it in, in Africa when there are so many single cell patients there? It's just impossible. And when we look at the pricing, once we have these things all set up, we talk about like probably thirty or fifty thousand dollars cost of production. Uh, so it's a huge, huge gap there that we can, uh, you know, we can address that. And we can uh, come with solutions there. We are working very, very hard with multiple groups there, nonprofit groups there, as well as you know have uh, several discussion with Serum uh, about uh, point of care production. And that's not not a central. It's not going to be UC Davis, for example, making this for everybody. It's going to be every center making it. But then we come with some sort of uh, 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 some sort of monitoring that every center, uh, you know, the data is coming out of that uh, is actually centrally regulated, uh, and and that's something that can go to FDA for approval there. And FDA already has shown interest in approving this kind of um, you know uh, process there. They're very very interested. Uh, they already told us they're interested. Uh, to learn more about this and how we can uh, how we can monitor this, how we can you know make sure that things are are, are kosher as far as FDA regulations there, uh, and 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 go through that. And there are examples of these already. You know, Spanish, for example, group there they went to their FDA uh, for approval. Their homegrown CAR T cells, uh, uh, and again, it can be CAR T cells. It can be other gene therapy protocols as well. Uh, so I, I think you know all of us. We're going to hear more about that in the next year. Uh, hopefully, Serum is going to come with some initiative as well to support this kind of point of care uh, applications there. Uh, so I, I think it's really exciting. So this is John again. I'd like to direct a um, a question to Mark Walters. So right now, for um, I'm supporting stem cell transplantation and gene therapy, Mark. Uh, don't patients have to come into the hospital for ablation of their bone marrow uh, and things like that? Can that possibly be done on an outpatient basis where uh, the inpatient facility isn't taxed um, to do that? Uh, um, probably not in the in the short term, although um, um, I think that that's something that we aspire to do. Um, th this is work uh, done by colleagues. I think on the call uh, on the panel, Anishka Chekowitz is here. Um, I mean, we, we we dream of being able to use non chemotherapy based regimens to clear to clear a niche for the modified stem cells to to um, to engraft and exert their their effects. So um, while we're not there today, and, and in fact the hemoglobin disorders in general because of the proliferative nature of, of the marrows where we hope to grow the healthy stem cells. Um, naturally impede growth of the modified um, cells will, will be challenging, but, um, but we're making advances. The other, the other thing I wanted to note was some, some new encouraging information just this week. Um, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, for example, um, has, has uh, new guidelines about stipulating that the, the cost of, of, uh, of the supportive care like we would administer through a bone marrow transplant or a cell therapy transplant relying on myelative therapy should be covered by the insurance the patients have, the Medicaid insurance, if that, since the majority of our sickle cell disease patients have that insurance. That would be a tremendous advance. While we couldn't do it as an outpatient, at least, at least uh, difficulties related to funding and enrolling patients 
um, that barrier would, would be reduced. And then um, another uh, imp important and exciting document from the, um, from the NASEM um, suggested partnerships between um, private and public insurance and funding sources, again, to ensure access to the therapies as they're developed in their current iteration. So, um, so while the, you know, we're still talking about the future for an outpatient procedure, um, and the thing we really dream of is being, being able to inject, let's say, um, targeted gene editing reagents that, it, that they can uh, find their stem cells in the marrow where they normally reside, um, be incorporated into the stem cells, do the editing, and then uh, naturally begin to produce the correct forms of, of hemoglobin. That, that space age um, approach is something we're working on now. So, so I don't know how long it'll take us to get there, but those are all things in the pipeline that uh, hopefully CIRM will, will, will be interested in supporting. And just apropos of that, and, and then I'll send it back to you, Dr. Heyman, because we know you have a litany of questions as well. Uh, there's a prime editing technology now where you can have guide RNAs and use our natural CRISPR enzymes, ADARs and Apobex as base editing enzymes to really have very site-specific editing. So I can see that if it could be targeted very specifically to hematopoietic stem cells for their progenitors as being an advance that maybe we can add to Mishka's uh, technology for reduced intensity condition, because I remember when I was a bone marrow transplant fellow at Stanford, I was doing the first reduced intensity conditioning transplant. We called it a mini transplant in the outpatient setting. So I was quite nervous. And that was many years ago, but my attending, uh, Rob Negrin, said, don't worry about it. It's going to work out. Well, it did work out. Um, so there are a lot of things we were quite doubtful about at the time that ended up becoming the mainstay of therapy. So I think that it really comes back to healthcare economics and whether the system sustained supportive care that patients need for these degenerative disorders really um, starts to be so prohibitive in terms of um, replacement therapies and frequent hospitalizations, um, multiple transfusions in the case of sickle cell. I think that uh, we'll find that it's actually cheaper as we did in standard bone marrow transplantation to give a potentially curative therapy in the, the short term and the long term if we get it right, like my dad was alluding to and Daniela and uh, John and you. Um, so I'll send it back to you, Dr. Heyman. Oh, thank you very much. It's all gr a great discussion, uh, really kind of about where things are headed and what we aspire to uh, for things to go. I guess I'll follow up with Dr. Abedi. Um, you know, we have a we have a mix of kind of, you know, between kind of physician scientists and on, on our, our webinar here, our symposium here, um, and with regards also kind of uh, patient, patient advocates. And so I guess maybe we can try to talk a little bit, you know, how do stem cell therapies different from, and stem cell uh, clinical trials different from traditional therapies? And what do you think is important for uh, both clinicians as well as the patients to know about that and kind of what they can offer, what they can offer? Yeah, thank you for the question. So I, I think the main thing is that uh, how multidisciplinary, uh, you know, these kind of clinical trials are, are very different than just administering a drug there when you're dealing with basically an infusion room and a physician mostly, maybe maybe involving radiology for, you know, for follow-up. Uh, just any examples, you know, Mark uh, and our group are, are working on a sickle cell, for example, and we're putting more initiative on that uh, as well in the near future, hopefully. It's just a huge teamwork effect, uh, you know, from a forces group to blood bank to uh, uh, progenitor lab to GMP facilities to uh, uh, obviously regulatory. It's a and and the, the BMT team that's dealing with that outpatient team and inpatient BMT teams that are working with that. It's a huge, uh, you know, task there and multi multiple uh, groups there. I mean, in fact, when for some of these uh, cell therapy drugs, when we ask um, uh, our traditional groups to uh, to work on that, there were there were issues that we have to just say, okay, we'll just take over because we are familiar with that system there. Uh, so I think it's a huge advantage of this kind of alpha clinic that are specialized in dealing with the cell therapy, uh, uh, you know, uh, protocols specifically. And they're not doing the traditional work. They're just focusing on that and making all those connections between the groups there to make sure these things are going smoothly. Great. Yeah, I would uh, I would further uh, sort of reiterate that point, which is that with uh, cell and gene therapies, 
the logistics and you know if you have your your clinical site right there at the place of production of the of the therapy that's that's absolutely you know advantageous but uh, many times these are are moving from one place in the country to another place in the country and so the logistics is actually a, a major topic of discussion around uh, cell therapies in particular. Uh, I would just add one other thing, which is uh, oftentimes these um, therapies, you know, we, we know that they theoretically can be curative, certainly they can be transformative, but oftentimes they're not a type that can be removed. There are a few examples in cell and gene where, where after administration, the product can be removed, but with a traditional clinical trial uh, for a medicine, for example, small molecule drug, uh, if there's issues, it, it, it can be, you know, withdrawn. <clears throat> but in the case of um, cell therapies or gene therapies, oftentimes it's, it's, it goes in and, and that's what it's going to be. And so I'd be curious to hear the other panelists' views on informed consent in this context, because I think this really brings informed consent into the, into the fore when you have something that really is not reversible. And uh, oftentimes, you know, if, if you're in a dire circumstance like advanced cancer, that's one thing, but with a disease like sickle cell or type one diabetes and uh, irreversible treatment, uh, I think the informed consent becomes particularly uh, sensitive and, you know, a patient's perspective on where they are, or sickle cell can be very different for a patient in, in the United States than from a lower middle income country. So I'm, I'm curious what the thoughts are on the susceptibility of the, of the patient, of the volunteer to their circumstances and the physician's um, both perspective on, on the product. Obviously, they're going to be enthusiastic about the product. They're trying to enroll for their trial, but also being sensitive to, to the patient's perspectives and, and, and their um, you know, sort of concerns that might be around uh, uh, a product that, that might be irreversible. I can, uh, I can maybe I can start answering and then I'll open up with the rest of the group there. Yes, it's a little bit different, but it's not necessarily very different because, you know, you can see the same thing with a drug as well. You give a drug, you have a side effect and that side effect can be life-threatening or cause an organ damage and can stay there forever. Uh, uh, so yes, uh, you know, we give a product to the patients that may last forever in the patients. And in fact, if it does, sometimes it's a good thing. We want that to, to last and we don't want to lose that. But yes, if there is a damage there, let's just say in, in a case of like allergenic transplant, if there is a graft or host disease and it lasts there, uh, many times we have, you know, in a situation like that, when uh, we are afraid of an irreversible damage there, we have a backup plan there. For example, if, uh, if this is the first in human product there that we're not sure if the product is going to uh, work. And if it doesn't work, this, you know, the patients uh, may not have enough hematopoietic cells to recover. We always have the collecting a backup product there. Uh, so for several of the trials that we are I'm working on, either in, in, you know, active or in process, we have backup products there that we can reverse the situations. In other situations, as you mentioned, uh, there are systems to delete the clone that, uh, uh, you know, activate it there and can cause a trouble if the CAR T cells uh, causing a, a bad reactions there, we can give a medication to delete that CAR T cell clone there uh, or, or get, you know, or give a medication to get, get rid of the whole clone altogether. Uh, uh, but you, your point is well taken about the consent. And I think uh, it's something uh, that uh, many times is overseen and it, it, it needs to be more clarified in consent. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear what other people are, are talking about. I think if we make the consent dynamic, dynamic informed consent based on data, uh, as we update it very quickly in real time, as you heard from Judy Faulkner, um, that you know capacity to get data out of very large data sets to say what is the real um, data or what are the real data showing us. It with she got data within 48 hours for a question that I asked her. I think what's happened before in terms of informed consent, uh, whether it's for adverse events or an update on data, maybe we're seeing more cases of myelodysplastic syndrome 
or AML in uh, stem cell gene therapy trials, how big a problem is that? Can we mine uh, EPIC? You know, we heard from Judy Faulkner that uh, she has something like 112 million people on EPIC. And while that is an aggregate, um, something we can plumb and get data out of, I think it's an important resource for patients to know that they can have access to real time, real world data. And uh, I think that's how we can um, really incentivize people to be involved in uh, taking on newer therapies. I think that the biggest issue about informed, informed consent is trust. Uh, people don't want to be experimented on. They're concerned about you know debacles in clinical trials um, like Tuskegee. I encountered that in, in the clinic actually on Wednesday from somebody who was absolutely determined that nobody near him would ever be vaccinated for COVID. Uh, he thought it was a grand experiment and that we didn't actually provide enough data but if we provide real data to people that they can actually mine themselves i think that the trust uh, will in, be enhanced uh, by patients and we're all going to be patients so i don't use that in a pejorative sense i just mean that we need data in real time and it can't have this six months to one year or even two year delay because of peer review you know peer review has been rather cumbersome i think that we need to open it up and uh, make things happen a little bit more quickly and you'll see in bioarchive, a lot of people are putting their stories out there first, just to give people the warning shot across the bow. The more people can get real data in real time, the better it will be for informed consent. I, th I think, yeah, um, Katrina, that you really struck a nerve for me with the, the trust message, which is um, trust of the individual family and patient you're treating, but also trust of the community, particularly in, in some of these rare disorders where um, you need to spend as much time informing the community about your trial and 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 some of the consequences that you might or might not have expected and, and the family themselves. And the other just piece of feedback that I've had from families who've gone through uh, patients who've gone through this is that they um, they want to be informed about how others fared on the trial and that there's that there's good follow up at the end of the trial so that anyone everyone who participated in it uh, gets gets information about the adverse events, whether expected or unexpected, as well as the success rate. So, so we have a responsibility to inform, again, not just our patients, but the broader community, and that will engender trust, I, trust, I suspect. I, I guess the challenge in that situation is that, you know, uh, you know, having patients in a community around a trial or around a, a rare disease with a given uh, therapy is that the, that the information needs to be thorough and, uh, you know, not just anecdotal because they hear from one person who happened to be the person that, uh, you know, had a, had a poor experience, but then overall the, their, their actual uh, potential outcome is going to be beneficial. You don't, want, you don't want things sort of getting lost in the, in the world of anecdotes. I guess that would be my, my one question or concern. Yeah, I always so talk systems to, yeah. systems in place for that it's kind of yeah you, have, you definitely have to stay in front of the the information curve which is not easy to do because right. it, it spreads so quickly yeah that's a real right. challenge yeah it's always uh you know having this discussion with the patients and uh, trying to write down the consent form you know I was uh, talking with my fellows about it's it's really an art to write the consent form uh you want to you know, be as frank and uh, as comprehensive as possible. At the same time, you don't want to be, you know, scaring the patients to death and just, you know, prevent them to do to go any trials, uh, as well. So finding that balance there uh, is, is sometimes challenging, especially with the gene therapy trials there. Uh, but uh, yeah, establishing that trust between the physicians and, as everybody alluded to, uh, that trust between the physician and the patient, I think that's critical. I would like to go actually back on that and say it's not about only the, what the patient uh, learns from the consent, but going back to the community the patient comes from and try to learn from the beginning. What are the things that are essential? We all know that the consent right now it's 50 pages and it can include a lot of information. And it should include a lot of information, but some informations are seen by some communities as being more important than others. And being able to have patient studios and community studios and learn what's meaningful for every community, I think it's going to be very informative for us in the future. Maybe I'll follow up uh, on our discussion with consent from a, a question from the audience uh, from Jeff Lomax who asked, 
what value can a network like the Alpha Clinics bring to ensure optimal and robust consent? And uh, I don't know if anybody feels compelled or really like strongly like to, to lead off to answer that question. Yeah, I think in terms of the network, um, Dr. Heyman, this is something where you can see we know each other very well. Uh, we communicate in real time and uh, we're very candid. You know, wait a minute, we're starting to see this. Um, watch out. We, you know, we think there may be a safety signal here, maybe even before it could be called a dose limiting toxicity. And, you know, I think as my dad was saying, not all of our therapies within the Alpha Clinic are cellular therapies. And even though they're not cellular therapies, they can still have serious adverse effects. So we have to watch out for pharmacogenomics that come into play for people's individual sensitivities to small molecules or biologics. So I think that you know we kind of do risk mitigation together as a team. It's the same thing as happened um, naturally with the bone marrow transplant registry, the IBMTR and uh, colleagues. The only thing with the uh, stem cell community here within the Alpha Clinic is we're really at the bleeding edge of technology. We're really taking on some very new um, technologies as Mark was alluding to, whether it's CRISPR, thinking about in vivo gene correction. Um, you know, John is going to bring new therapies to bear that um, alter splicing potentially. How does that fit in with cellular therapies? Daniela is working with patients who have neurodegenerative disorders. Amir Dad works on HIV and uh, many other things, including sickle cell. But I, I think the point is, um, you know, we're able to communicate very quickly. And that's why it's important to have a network. Also, the patients can actually be seen closer to home. You know, so they may see Dr. Abedi up at UC Davis, but actually come here to UC San Diego to complete their treatment. Or they could be at UCSF um, seeing Dr. Walters for a uh, you know, stem cell gene therapy trial for sickle cell or beta thalassemia and go and see Dr. Boda's um, team at UC Irvine or be seen at UCLA. Um, and of course, we're not mentioning John Zaya at City of Hope, but he's been uh, really the person who pioneered this idea. So what we've had, going back to the old uh, that Mayor Dad was alluding to, we've been able to develop accelerated confidentiality agreements, accelerated clinical trial agreements, accelerated regulatory documents that make it um, cheaper, better, faster, smarter for getting clinical trials up and running. So there's a real power to the network. And that helps patients. I think it makes the whole thing cheaper, actually. I think we're, we've got a lot to bring to bear, and we can just do this on a larger scale. If we do what Danielle is suggesting, is really learn from the communities. And, you know, obviously, Mark has been dealing with this a lot with the populations that he's been able to help with his really erudite therapies. But that's something that we need to do a sort of gap analysis for, I would say, rather than presuming we know what individual communities need, we need to hear from them and uh, be part of the community. But, but as far as the process goes, we, we've um, we've made some real inroads. So this this gets at what Kat uh, was saying about cl clinical trial agreements being accelerated. So using a single IRB, for example, that uh, that other um, that other UC sites can. I mean that well, I just did one um, recently, and and our IRB yeah. said that was the fastest single IRB we've ever done. So when you have a a, a group of like minded cell therapy. Um, programmatic teams that know how to accelerate things because they they know all the nomenclature and 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 the and the tricks. It really it really speeds things along. And and we utilize the same consent forms to to a large extent. So if somebody has a a, a template that that resonates across more than one site, then it, it's fairly easy to adopt that. So th those are some of the um, the streamlined uh, activities that the alpha stem cell clinics have really catalyzed in, in this field. One thing that, uh, uh, you know, Serum just did, I think it was a really excellent job, uh, you know, going back to this, you know, question that how Serum can, can help with the consent. And, uh, uh, you know, when that issue about the, the sickle cell, uh, you know, an MDS, you know, secondary malignancy came, Serum came immediately with uh, with a meeting with a whole you know with a big group of people there, and I think that was really excellent that you know put everybody in the same room, uh, you know as many people as possible with some really good expert there uh, like Mark and and other people, and then we have a good discussion, 
uh, uh, because now we're going to go back to the patients and, and have that discussion. So the more knowledge we have in this field uh, that's evolving every moment, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, the more productive we can be when we have this discussion with the patients there uh, to be as upfront and at the same time as, as clear as possible. Uh, so any issue, any new things, any new direction, uh, CRM can help with getting everybody together, getting the best expert in the field together, and and uh, and trying to uh, educate all the centers at the same time. Fantastic. Well, we spent a lot of time on consents, um, and so maybe we'll try to talk, kind of move forward a little bit about kind of continue kind of our I think our initial discussion about where things are hopefully are are, are moving forward and kind of the, the landscape of stem cell therapies, and so. I'll start with you, Dr. Jameson. How do you, where do you see the landscape for stem cell therapies in the next five years and kind of the, the treatment paradigm going forward? I like Chris Mason's book on the next 500 years. Uh, you know, I think uh, this, this field is here to stay. And you could hear the amazing discoveries in tissue engineering yesterday, uh, the basic science discoveries that will help with conditioning regimens. But I think the way the field is going to move forward is the bench to bedside and back again approach. You know, they will understand in the clinic why some people are responding beautifully and other people aren't to the same therapy. I think um, that uh, stem cell genomics, transcriptomics, proteomics, and as we heard from Andreas Trump at the single cell level, can give us some predictive information that will allow patients to make better choices, not just about their initial therapy, but about subsequent therapies. Also, I think uh, we need to think about mitigation strategies. If we do think that we're causing cancer stem cells to arise as a result of our gene therapy correction methods, can we do something about that? So you're doing some very nice clinical trials targeting uh, cancer stem cells, Ben. Uh, so that's what I see as a major opportunity from CIRM, not just to target cancer stem cells that have the capacity to clone themselves, but catch cancer in its infancy at the pre-cancer stem cell stage. So I think that will be a big thing that comes from stem cell science, understanding that clonal hierarchy in cancer and how these cells behave in the context of a specific microenvironment, I think that having small molecules and biologics that enhance endogenous repair and regeneration will be a next explosive wave that comes from CERM funding, especially when it's partnered um, with uh, industry and uh, maybe other funding organizations, NASA, NCI, NIH. I think we're going to see um, quite an advance in tissue engineering, as we started to hear about yesterday, and you know maybe AI-driven algorithms to determine who's most likely to benefit from one of these therapies. Instead of trying to have the physician guide somebody through this, maybe there are much more bespoke algorithms that will allow us to look at risk, um, genetic risk, but also other components of comorbidities that we may not focus on as much at the moment, but may predict outcomes in the future. So that's what I see is coming. And then obviously, patients having access to more data in real time. Uh, that's why I was so pleased to have Judy Faulkner from Epic here. But that's just an example of something that I think the stem cell field can embrace um, with the help of the translating center, UG, no pressure at all. Uh, but <laughs> uh, I think yeah. a lot we can build on. So this is John. Go ahead, John. Uh, this is John at UCLA. And one of the things that I've become recently interested in is the use of a random causal forest analysis to determine uh, exactly who, which individuals in a clinical trial, for instance, even if it's a very small trial, might respond effectively to the um, therapeutic and those who will not, as well as those who will be actually harmed by the therapy. And uh, this kind of mediation analysis, I think we will, if we put it to use in the network, can really help us a lot with the um, you know, industry um, dominated CAR T cell therapeutics that we all deal with. Uh, even if you have a trial where there is no direct effect or no uh, significant difference in the outcome, you can still mine those trials for intermittent, intermittent uh, mediators that you can determine will, uh, that you can assay and tell you whether a certain patient will be responsive to a certain therapeutic. 
So I'm really excited to see this new kind of um, uh, artificial intelligence really bring to the fore things that we never look for in large scale or even small scale, scale clinical trials. Where do if we... I... Go Sorry. Ahead. No, go ahead. I, I, I was just gonna jump in here. Uh, it seems like a great segue into something that I hadn't planned on talking about, but uh, I'm a representative of IQVIA. IQVIA uh, is really the, the hub in another hub and spoke, which is the translating center. The translating center works along alongside the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic uh, network to basically facilitate moving uh, CERM grantees as well as non-grantees, but uh, CERM grantees projects along in the product development life cycle from focusing on the, on the preclinical and non-clinical elements, but complementing the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic network in that regard, we uh, bring projects from concept to clinic and beyond. And that's, that's our primary uh, mandate from CERM at the Translating Center is to assist uh, grantees in, in advancing their projects into the clinic. But we also have um, some innovations going on, which are not specific to certain uh, customers or, or grantees, but instead intended to help the, uh, the field more generally. And uh, this question of variable response to a given cell therapy for a given disease is something we've been working on. IQVIA is uh, the human data science company and so obviously has uh, tremendous uh, capabilities in terms of AI, ML. And the, the concept that we're just getting rolling now is we're, we're calling it the evidence engine. And the, the way that it works is to uh, collect for a given um, cell therapy or gene therapy and a given disease, uh, all the data that we can. There's a tremendous, tremendous amount of data out there. And we want to start at the beginning, which is the characteristics of the patient in the case of the leukophoresis. What are the characteristics? What are the, the measures that we can collect on the leukopack? When the leukopack is being processed, uh, what are the variables that are going into that manufacturing process all the way from, you know, what's the lot number of, of the, you know, the reagents to the, the dwell time here, uh, and then carrying that data collection as a thread patient by patient from the characteristics of the patient, the characteristics of their disease, that could even include the, the patient's genomics or other omics <clears throat> into the manufacturing process through the treatment and the outcomes, and ultimately all the way out to reimbursement. But the idea of this evidence engine is to iterate, firstly, for a given disease and treatment, uh, all the data that we can collect. So the, the first version of this is, let's see if we can get this data together. The data come from disparate um, groups, diff different people, different departments, different institutions, different formats. And so that's where we feel like we can bring um, some, some competency to this in terms of getting the data all into formats that can speak to each other. And in this way, begin to elucidate variables in the inputs that can affect the outcomes of, of, that, of that patient's experience. So firstly, it's about making correlations, finding um, perhaps interactions. There's going to be complex interactions, multivariate analysis in this, uh, in this system, but finding correlations between input variables and how things go in terms of safety and efficacy on the outside, on the, on the output. But um, ultimately, as you were saying, Katrina, having a predictive, a predictive algorithm where if this patient has these characteristics, um, maybe people today have a, have a, have a, a notion or a hypothesis that, that that may or may not be a good patient to put into this this trial, um, we should be able to drive it through data and you know the computers being able to see things that we may not see readily and bringing data from all disparate sources so that with this evidence engine, we can create kind of a predictive algorithm. This patient will be good for this treatment and this patient should not be in that trial, but should be over here in this trial. So that's, that's a, a, a platform that we're getting going right now and uh, starting to put the first data in from one of our uh, industry uh, partners. 
in immuno oncology. So we're super excited about that. I know we've talked with uh, some of our alpha stem cell clinic uh, partners about that as well. But I thought I I would throw that in there since it's something we're actively working on right now. And and you did bring up the topic. Murdad, did you have a comment? No, no, I was just uh, going back to that question five years from now, uh, uh, you know, and uh, Kat mentioned 500. I'm, I'm actually worried about just next year because there is tremendous number of, uh, you know, so many of these things coming and how we're going to handle that, you know, what's the infrastructure to, to deal with that. Uh, just the application of just one technology, which is CAR T cells. It's not... Uh, you know, he malignancy now is going to go to solid tumors. And even one single application approved for solid tumor, let's just say for lung cancer or renal cancer, uh, the number of the, the subjects that will be eligible will be so huge that, you know, it's going to be so hard to catch up with the, with the numbers. And then from there, we, you know, we are having clinical trials for the autoimmune disorders. My senior gravity is working with uh, Daniela uh, group there and, and, and that, uh, you know, the, uh, work with the UPenn we're doing for the uh, for the panficus. Uh, work with uh, other groups there for other autoimmune disorders. We are start you know starting to do uh, the application of CAR T cells for uh, for cancer. Uh, for I'm sorry for infectious disease like uh, HIV for example. We're working with UCSF on that. Uh, you know the serum funded clinical trials on UCSF for HIV. I think it just you know it's just mind blowing and as cat was saying this is something that's going to stay and it's going to expand to a levels that we never ever seen before in every single aspect of medicine i would i would agree with that there's a, effectively a, an explosion of companies and ideas especially in immuno oncology i think what happened was uh, you know the investors had been a little bit frustrated after 10 or 20 years um with cell and gene therapy not really producing results, but now with the successes we've seen in the last couple of years, there's a lot of money coming into the space. And so accordingly, um, you know, a, a lot more companies are getting funded. And now these companies are coming to the manufacturing facilities, the clinical sites um, and saying, Hey, can you, can you help us out? Can we, can you ma make our material for us? Can you run our trial for us? And so I think our system is going to need to ramp up its capacity. Uh, one of the things uh, that's sort of happened most lately is that um, the facilities were, were one of the were one of the rate limiting factors in this uh, sort of explosion of of ideas and new treatments coming on online. But um, now I think it's becoming personnel. So we're looking more and more to training programs. And I know CIRM is. CIRM is ramping up their training programs uh, uh, at IQVIA. We're working with Cal State System to, and Biocom to uh, set up a training system for, for a, uh, uh, you know, a biologics manufacturing technician. So um, you know, I think that we need to get more people excited about the field and, and get more uh, young folks involved and uh, you know, just basically fill, fill our field with personnel to, to do all these great ideas. Well, yeah, I, I agree. It's, it's certainly been exciting times, certainly in immunology, where things are headed, certainly now and certainly separate fields, as, as Dr. Petty was saying. Well, I think we are reaching the end of our panel discussion here. Uh, I want to thank everybody for all the, all the panelists who've really given us a really vigorous discussion about, I think, the three things we really focused on, where things are headed when it comes to the alpha stem cell clinics kind of how the alpha stem cell clinics have been able to, uh, in conjunction, of course, with the help of IQV, have been able to kind of be an accelerating infrastructure for the development of uh, stem cell treatments for patients. And then also, where do we think things are going with regards to stem cell-directed therapies the next five, well, maybe one year, the next five, potentially 500 years? Um, so I'd like to thank again all of our, our panelists and everybody here who's joined us today. Thank you for having us. Yeah, very nicely done. Great to see everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ben. Yeah. Thank you, Katrina.